Hello, and welcome back to Kenshin Impact. Audible. Well. Let me see what my thing is. 133, yeah, uh, it should be fine here. Uh, let's go to somewhere nice and quiet to have our uh, audible session. Actually, what are these? Ah, this guy again. Should I, should I go, go back to this guy? Yeah, I, I guess I should. The guy who's trying to fish. Let's see what he has first. Change our team. Helbert and Kayvon, please try the new bait again, Mr. Kayvon. I've done that so many times, but the result are just results are just the same as before. Huh? Are the two of you fishing together again? Traveler, we meet again. Hello, you two. Have you found out why the fish refused to take the bait? Did you learn anything from the researchers? <laughs> Nope. A researcher and I tried methods like modifying the fishing rod, adjusting the bait, and improving our techniques. We tried so many different bodies of water and angles. I even tried fishing in a pond full of fish. But no matter what I did, I could only fish up things that aren't fish. Don't worry, Mr. Kayvon. Didn't that researcher promise to keep researching? You'll definitely determine the reason behind all this for us. See, he even designed a new bait for you, and he wants me to stay here with you and record every detail about your fishing process down. I hope he really succeeds, but until then, I'll just continue fishing my way. If you were a traveler, could you get me some more material for bait? What sort of materials do you need this time? Let me think. This time, I need a... a special sweet flower. There's a place with pretty good sweet flowers. I'll mark it out on your map. I hope you'll be able to catch a fish some fish today. Feeling pretty good today. It probably won't take long to catch something once I get the materials and get some bait. And make some bait. Have I read this? Someone seems to have burnt the contents in a hurry. Only a few words remain legible now. Found a large group of mechanism. Similar to the huge walking machinery we previously found at the ruins of Gurubad. After a preliminary investigation, I reckon that they are from the same era. The key parts missing in the Gurubad samples, excuse me for the rash name, have been found here. It may be possible to repair the machinery's automatic system. Found an organization called Swan and Ritter, and its existence may be confirmed by the legend of Ruins of Dari. Recorder, Trainee Duster, Zandik. Yeah. 
ここよ There's so many monsters here. I said we have to take them down first. Spinning. Oh, there we Special sweet flower. Sweet flower need for making angler cave on special bait. For some reason, sweet flowers of this kind hold some appeal for monsters, such that they would willingly collect them. Oh, whatever. Moving on. Oh, <laughs> got launched a little bit. The bait this time requires sensedia, wheat, and special wheat flour. Did you get them all? Yes. Not bad. Now it's time to fish. I'm gonna catch a big one this time. Kayvan prepares the bait and begins fishing. Kayvan catches a wet package a short while later. Ah, uh, let me have a look. Huh? Things in here. They seem like lost items again. As expected of you. <laughs> As expected of you. Uh, we've been fishing ever since Mr. Kayvan and I went to that researcher to modify our bait. But Mr. Kayvan still fishes up strange things every single time. Including lost items. or from the bottom of the river. Packages that fell off ships. Even some adventurer who accidentally fell into the water once grabbed onto Mr. Kayvan's fishing line to get out of the water. We just can't catch any fish. My fishing career has come to its end. M Mr. Kayvan, cheer up. Look, the owner of this thing is definitely anxious. He'll definitely be overjoyed that you fished it up. We may even be compensated when we take these lost items back to the Adventurers Guild. But I... Really, I really just want, I really just want to catch a fish. <sighs> well, anyway, before we get sidetracked too much, let's head to our original destination in the Fontaine. And, uh, we just, uh, yeah, this one will do, right? This trench. We'll go here. Uh, maybe here is better. Might get a better view.
Are they gonna try to attack me from in here? Can't attack me. Get out of here. Good. Did they actually even give up? See what music you got. They'll do. Is it actually localized? I think it is. It's actually coming from this well, direction. Let's read. I think it's Noblesse Oblige. I'm up to. Yeah, here. Noblesse Oblige. Um. Shit. Okay. I'm starting with the flower. A satin flower, uh, royal flora. A satin flower with a glossy finish, fit for an elegant gathering. It still looks as distinguished as it did on the day it was cast aside. A blue lily made of silky satin that once served as a noblewoman's headdress. A noble who once ruled over Mondstadt left it behind. In that legendary age, the nobles were examples for the people. They guided their subjects with their conduct and wisdom. They were the true representation of the people of Mondstadt. They were noble, not only in lineage, but also in their commitment to virtues and principles. The longevity of the nobles was cut short by their endless self-indulgence. Ostentation gave way to divulge, devolution. Royal Plume, a feathered hat accessory worn by the old aristocrats of Mondstadt on hunts. It still stands proudly as if no time has passed. The feather of a falcon uh, proudly perched on top of an old noble's hat. Hunting with the common folk and sharing the spoils with them was an old tradition. Commonplace were the hunts, a hobby of the ruling class of Mondstadt. The festivities were shared with their servants and the common folk. As a sign of the benevolence of the nobles, all the people were eager, uh, were eager participants in the festivities. Hunts soon lost their meaning. The nobles took everything as their own, presuming it their right. Proudly the feather still stood, yet faded was its color in the people's eyes. Yeah, it started off with good intentions, but then ended up straying. Ah, oh, fucking hell. Okay, Royal Pocket Watch. A pocket watch that once belonged to the old aristocrats of Mondstadt, passed down from generation to generation, it has witnessed many years of history. <clears throat> An exquisite pocket watch made of sapphire. It remains functional even after all these years. The pocket watch of a noble who once ruled over Mondstadt. The time it tells is still accurate. Punctuality is a virtue. In this pocket watch. Helped the nobles stay on a virtuous path. It was more for self-discipline than a tool to influence the common folk. At daybreak, a worthy noble must be more vigilant than his people. At night, he should be more thoughtful and restless than they. Over the years, the once strict schedule was overturned by their indolent descendants. Their timepieces grew more extravagant 
but lost their virtuous function. Royal Silver Urn An ornamental urn that once belonged to the old aristocrats of Mondstadt. Mournful winds seem to echo within its empty interior. An ornamental urn made of sapphire, bearing the silver insignia of a noble house. It is exquisite and elegant, a testament to the aesthetics of the ancient nobles of Mondstadt. A noble who once ruled over Mondstadt left it behind. However, the extravagant treasures that once lay inside are now gone. These luxuries were symbols of the noble's stature, as well as the confidence, pride, and prosperity of the people of Mondstadt. Then, the nobles fell prey to power, a token they spent without regard for the people. Luxurious accessories became vanity items. Royal Musk A masquerade mask worn by the old aristocrats of Mondstadt. Its hollow eyes are fixated on the golden days of the past. A silver mask inlaid with gold and gems and engraved with delicate part patterns. Delicately made, it showcases the elegance and customs of the old nobles. The first nobles who rose up to rule Mondstadt began as heroes of humble origins. These great chieftains and elegant princes, as well as beautiful princesses and noble men, once welcomed the people to their banquets and feasts. In those days long past, the nobles shared their wisdom and elegance generously. In their golden age, the nobles shared with the people their knowledge and profits. But the later nobles were seduced by power. Their banquets were exclusively for their own pleasure. Bloodstained Chivalry Bloodstained flower of iron, a dried flower that is stained black with blood, and now as hard as steel, probably some sort of a memento for its former master. A common white flower given to the knight. Oh, it's white, white flower by a rescued damsel, given to a knight by a rescued damsel. It is dried and hardened. By the blood from all his bloodshed. Thanking him for his valor, the damsel offered a reward. He turned down all she gave, save for a pure white flower. For a knight, chivalry is its uh, for a knight chivalry is its own reward. This flower shall be my medal. That is all I need. He wore the flower upon his heart. Like his armor, it was stained as black as a winter's night. Like his heart, he was hardened, like a tempered blade. Bloodstained Black Plume A raven feather pinned to a knight's cape. Countless bloodstains have died at pitch black. One of the countless raven feathers stuck to the bloodstained knight. For where there is, no, for where there is blood, ravens shall follow. In the end, the bloodstained knight could no longer tell whether the blood that stained him was his own or that of his enemies. Eventually, on his long journey filled with bloodshed, he came to a realization. His path of so-called chivalry had turned him from the white knight he used to be into the monster he had now become. His only followers were the ravens drawn to the bloodshed he left in his wake. You know... This bloodstained knight really reminds me of Alakino. Alakino. That's why her hands are stained black. You reckon that she's a bloodstained knight? This mentioned it as a he, but Alakino is also mentioned as a father. So maybe. Maybe this is Alakino's set. Oh, fuck. Every fucking time. <sighs> Bloodstained Final Hour. A timepiece once used by a knight, 
The liquid inside has dried up, rendering it useless. Did they really use this to tell time? Oh, now it's dripping with blood. Deep in the abyss, where celestial bodies cast no light, the bloodstained knight kept his this timepiece, though time had lost all meaning. At an end was the bloodstained knight's story, for he realized there was no place for him on this earth. He ventured into the fallen ancient kingdom and died in battle in the monster's lair. At the bottom of the world, he learned the origin of the monsters that destroyed the ancient kingdom. The ancient kingdom was wrongfully cursed, turning its inhabitants into monsters. The code of chivalry tolerates not such injustice. If abyss be thy name, I pledge to you my loyalty. So the ancient kingdom, Kandria, turning its inhabitants into monsters, he had chose. The code of chivalry tolerates not such injustice, so sided with the abyss. So it seems less that Arahino, unless she did side with the abyss. Anyway, Bloodstained Chevalier's Goblet. The dark metallic vessel owned by the Bloodstained Knight. Its exterior has been stained as black as the night by smoke and co coagulated blood. Originally an exquisite silver goblet with gold engravings depicting the feats of a chivalrous knight. But blood and smoke have stained the cup beyond recognition. Covered in blood, the knight who slayed demons returned from the scourged battlefield, only to find that those waiting his rescue were nowhere to be found. Among the burning, collapsed houses, defeated, the bloodstained knight took the smoke-blackened goblet and vowed to rid the world of monsters, of poverty, and of evil. Bloodstained Iron Mask The iron mask that uh, the knight used to conceal their identity. Many have speculated about the face behind the mask. A luxurious platinum mask that once belonged to a knight of noble birth. The dark stains of dry blood are now a permanent part of its appearance. As the bloodstained knight reached out to help a person in need after slaying the monster, the way she cowed in fear made the knight realize he was now a monster himself, tainted by the blood and cruelty of his drawn-out war. Shield me from the eyes, for those I vowed to protect, and shield them from the horrors I am bound to affect. This archaic Petra, mas- uh, not mask. Fuck! Flower of Crevice Cliff. Okay, a flower born of the minerals and rocks of cliffside cracks. The way its petals blow in the wind makes it seem alive. Is it not? A flower that bloomed in a cliff's impregnable cleft. It is an exquisite life shaped by the essence of Geo. There is a folk saying that goes thus. In times of yore, someone told the Lord of Geo that there was no life to be found in barren stone. Thus did the Lord of Geo command flowers of purest gold to burst forth from the face of an uneven rock. Perhaps the Geo Archon did once work such a great wonder. Or perhaps it is just it is but one of the many tales that shroud this ancient world. But the prosperous harbour that grew out of the lifeless mountains, and that braves the raging waves of the sea of clouds, perhaps that was the brilliant flower after all. Will you harbour? Feather of Jagged Peaks A hard feather from a large sea cliff hawk. The basalt tip of the feather sometimes glistens with a cool dew. 
a feather left behind by the giant wings that flattened the mountains. Mountains. Though its tip had long turned a deep black, this feather remained sharp as a naked blade. They say that in ancient times, when the world was in turmoil, Rex Lapis uprooted mountains to create a giant bird of prey. The bird was carved out of rock and jade, and it soared above the ground the moment it had taken shape. Spiraling toward the heavens, it pierced through the clouds and flattened many stone peaks therein. They say that the rock kite spread its wings and dived towards the ocean, plummeting from the sky like a sharpened spear right into the heart of the sea and the monsters within. And they say that the pillars of stone that jut out from the ocean continue to attract birds to this day. Oh... So that's those stone spears that he made. But it's actually not a stone spear, it's a stone bird. A giant geo bird. Oh. So all those um fan visualizations of act of of it being spears is actually wrong. It's it's Giant stone birds. Alright. Sundial of Enduring Jade. A sundial carved from a single large piece of jade. It's lined with a pattern that silently records the passage of time. A sundial made using regal jade. It silently pursues both time and tide. Even rocks that have stood firm for time immemorial will eventually disintegrate over time, crumbling into dust and gravel. Legend has it that the Lord of Geo once made the glittering stars of the earth into devices for telling time. All the better to teach the ancient humans about the value of, e of every moment. Over the passage of time, this sundial came to be the prized possession of Kun Wu, who was then still a young scholar in training. When I was young, I dreamed of studying the classics and going to Sumeru to attain the greatest wisdom. Yet when, I, when gaining this dial, I played with and examined it for many long days and could not find, it, find in it a single flaw. Thus I changed tacks and sought a master craftsman to learn a new trade and thereby challenged the creator of this divine tool. Kun Wu? Who the hell's Kun Wu? Oh well, whatever. Goblet of Chiseled Crag. A resplendent yet dignified wine goblet, once filled to the brim in an era long gone. A vessel for wine carved from immovable rock. It is said to be filled with the ambrosia of sovereigns. It behooves basalt to be impregnable, and crystal to shine in its translucence. Going incognito amongst mortals should be likewise exquisite in its enjoyments. Folk legend holds that in order to drink wine, Rex Lapis brought forth bedrock and carved jade and lovely stone into a wine vessel for himself. Some even say that there were once seven such vessels. One for each archon. Maybe. Is that really a vessel? <sighs> so that's six corners? I'm pretty sure he used a vessel which had four corners. Oh, well, whatever. Mask of Solitude Basalt. A solemn mask exquisitely carved from basalt. Its hollow eyes stare ahead, expressionless and cold. It is said that during the years when gods contended against one another, Rex Lapis's aspect was that of a boundless slaughter. In those gaudy god battles, one could never have ascribed gentleness to him. He knew right from wrong and never missed his mark. In those days of tumult, he would show no mercy, even to friend-turned-foes. 
Rex Lapis's stone-cold expression never once changed throughout that storied age. They say that only when the dust settled did he lay down that immovable, unmovable visage. But it had been necessary, for he had donned it to fulfill a contract. Oh, contract with whom? This is Retracing Bolide, Summer Night's Mask, a pop, uh, no, not a mask, Summer Night's Bloom, a man-made flower in eternal bloom. Who knows if there truly is life in there? A summer festival flower that blooms forever, that will not wilt even if buried deep below the snow, that will not wilt even if buried deep below the snow. Huh. Some may label it an imitation, a false, uh, and false life, a false life, for life ch uh, lies in change, pain and growth, in meetings and also in partings. But the memories of meeting her of watching the fireworks bloom in the sky like fresh flowers together. The memories of that foxy-edged woman, a uh, foxy-eyed woman, who eventually disappeared without a trace. That unwithering flower is the final thing to remember her by. In the end, the difference comes down to the fact that for some, life is as eternal as this undying summer bloom. But for most, it is as transient as smoke. Who? Foxy-eyed woman? Oh, well, whatever. Summer Night's Finale. A well-crafted wooden dart. It will only stop once it has reached its destination. An intricately made throwing dart. It is a common sight during the summer festival. In the ghost stories of Inazuma, there is a tale about a meeting between the human and inhuman. To celebrate my wife's pregnancy, I went to the shrine to give a votive offering. But for reasons unknown, I went up the mountain with these objects. The water balloon from when I was seven, the fox mask from when I was seventeen, and a flower that will, would not wilt in ten or even a hundred years. Why did I expect to meet her again? No matchmaker introduced myself and my wife, and we were always short on money. And it took some time for us to produce an heir, but our days were still filled with happiness, were they not? But still I de detoured on that mountain road to the place where I'd seen the fireworks with her. Pulling the bushes apart, I thought I saw her dressed in white, sitting upon that rock. But when I came forward and looked, it was just a fox sunbathing. It leapt up the s at the sound of snapping branches and fled into the woods. And like the spots of light that poked between leaves moved by the breeze, it was gone in a flash. All that was left was an old wooden throwing dart. Tale about meeting between a human and inhuman. So is this his wife? <sighs> Maybe. Alright, Summer Night's Moment. A pocket watch that has stopped at a certain point in time. A small ornate pocket watch. The watch seems to have stopped at a certain time of day. In the ghost stories of Inazuma, this is something to do with an encounter with something inhuman. On the night of the summer festival, as I walked the path to the shrine with the girl I admired, I heard only barely the sound of a lost child's cries. In that moment of distraction, I fell, spraining my ankle and breaking that pocket watch. While she ran to look for some ointment, I tried to make way for the people passing through, 
and sat down on a rock by the wayside to rest. A beautiful mask-wearing woman sat down beside me. There are few who know about this spot, but it's the best place to watch the fireworks, you know. It should have been a dream. We hadn't met in ten years, and she had aged not a single day in those years, and yet... You've grown so much. Looks like we should pass on the game of Fusen. I've brought wine, though. Let's watch the fireworks together. What do you say? Okay, so uh, that's not his wife. That is his friend. A yokai, I guess. Summer Night's Water Balloon. Water balloons can be seen everywhere during the summer festival. But none are as finely wrought as this one. This one is the one that he brought when he was seven. <sighs> and this is the one he brought when he was 17. A beautiful water balloon filled with water. In the ghost stories of Inazuma, this is a memento from a chance meeting with something inhuman. During the summer festival, I was separated from my parents. It was but a moment, but I had wanted to look at the water balloons and let go of my hand that had gripped onto my father's sleeve. Before we knew it, the tide of people escorting the divine palanquin had washed us apart. I cried by the Tori gates along the road to the shrine, and I counted the feet of the people ascending the mountain. I do not know when it happened. But a beautiful fox with a uh, beautiful lady with fox like eyes had come to my side and taken my hand. How preposterous to leave such an adorable child here. So, how about it? Would you like to see the fireworks? Throw some darts and play Fusen with me? Summer Night's Mask. A poplar mask cast in the image of a deity, as described in the legends. The mask of one indwelt by a deity. A mask that had been cast in the image of some legendary deity. People will often take on the guise of the fox of legend, covering their faces with masks based on their divine visage, based on her divine visage. I was wishing that they might gain her ability of, tra of transformation. In Inazuma's legends, everything has a spirit. But even so, it is likely that most such beings would have long fled. Driven into the forest by the suppression of the, of the Shogun. Shogun. But many people still believe in these divine foxes and their ability to be indwelt by them. They believe that thousands of years of age may confer power upon animals. As such, they also believe in what this fox mask represents. A note has been left on the back of this mask, written in a lovely hand. I'm sorry I departed under the cover of the fireworks. We will most likely never meet again. Take care of yourself. Okay. Not this one, I think it's this one. I thought I saw her dressed in white sitting upon that rock. When it came forward, look, it was just walk, fox sunbathing. So, uh, it never tells you the color of the fox, but I'm, I'm thinking that it might be Yaimiko. It's her uh, encounter with a human. And playing Fusen. Well, anyway. Uh, fucking hell, every time. Alright. This is Heart of Depth. Gilded Corsage. A mantle brooch that has lost its luster. The gold plating that once adorned it was ground away by the wind and the waves long ago. 
Right. A corsage whose coloration has been blistered away by the sea salt wind. Even a man who wanders the ocean waves has items and memories that he prizes. The great warship raised its anchor and headed out to sea, and the chief mate once more left harbour with the skipper. For the skipper's absurd pursuit, and for his own faded memories, the chief mate hummed a crappy shanty <laughs> of his own composing, forming a chorus with the whales and the waves. The scoundrel who gave up his family name, and the witch who hunted him never reached the sea. The wise stepbrother who could not be an heir became head at last, or did he? Words that cannot be sung. Have I also forsaken the truth for illusions? Having lost it all and given it all up and then sinking beneath the waves? Maybe this isn't the worst of things after all. <laughs> I, I, I don't know the melody at all. <laughs> Maybe it is just a crappy shanty. <laughs> anyway, Gust of Nostalgia. A feather carried over by whimpering sea winds and crimson waves. The passage of time has changed its shape and color. A red feather is an ill omen, perhaps even a portent of death. It washed ashore one day together with the corpse of a great, great sea creature. The cynical chief mate was no native of Liyue. Rather, he came from a great land ruled by an aristocracy. Mondstadt? A bit grey. All said he, all said that he too was once such a noble. But he must have disgraced his house and been turned out as, as a result. That was but baseless hearsay. However, for when... He first came to the harbour. He carried naught but a slim sword and a small sapphire blue feather pinned to his mantle. Sapphire blue feather. Noblesse oblige? Later, the wanderer would throw in with the skipper and set out to sea, contending with great waves and sea creatures alike. That once azure blue feather would also be stained red by blood and by the salt of the great ocean. In his last moment, he clearly recalled those days, now drowned in drink, like treasure in the sand brought to light by the lapping waves. Copper Compass An ancient bronze compass, its needle points towards some ever-distant shore, to a non-existent harbour. A bronze compass used by a sea seaman. <laughs> In an ever tumultuous life of wandering, it points towards the direction where its owner's heart lies. The rough skipper once used this compass to guide his huge ship, navigating treacherous ocean paths and conquering huge whirlpools. It also guided the one whose deep hatred hid behind an uninhibited laugh, and who won and who lost and despondent sought death and burning drink. I believe you all sing that the thief could not avoid the gallows in the end, eh? And as you... Uh, as long as you have a place to belong to, even ending up in the belly of a fish would be alright. Hey now, didn't you sign a contract with this ship when you came aboard? That memory didn't get washed down with the wine, did it? Good. Then, after all, it's time to fulfill your contract. Is that so? Well, alright. It doesn't matter anymore. Anyway. I wonder who that is. Goblet of Thundering Deep. A faded wine cup that was unintentionally dredged up from the sea. Its dull exterior tells of the days it has spent beneath the waves. A faded but finely crafted wine cup, ground down by the sands in the sea steps. Depths. The exquisite cup fell from the chief mate's hand, raising tiny ripples as it hit the ocean surface. What did it see amid the schools of fish in the dying light? 
nor had he encountered amidst the silent alleys, before the bars of the flower-inlaid windows of a secret tryst. Down and down the dark gold cup sank into the dreams of the sea monster and into the dreams of the chief maid. Some day I will return the favor for this mark of humiliation that you left upon me. The moonlight illuminated sapphire eyes that, sh that striking scar. In his memory, her countenance grew brighter, beautiful, cold, and proud. But he had forgotten what he had said then, and grew suddenly despondent as a result. Come to think of it, how many times have I forgotten the past? <laughs> Does it matter how you retell the past? All deaths are in vain. There is no saving that which has already sunk. Don't know what the story about this thing is about. Wine-stained tricorn. An ancient wine-stained sea hat that still reeks of alcohol even now. A tricorn hat thick with the smell of alcohol. Its shape and design symbolized the position of its owner. The hard-drinking chief mate was lost in a drunken reverie from morning till night and was rarely ever sober. He reeked of alcohol all over, mumbling often of tattered memories. The jovial skipper did not reprimand him, however, and indeed kept giving him important responsibilities. Well, we are both people without a thing to our names, eh? <laughs> The wine sodden sea hat was thus, was thrust by a storm into the sky and then carried away on the rolling waves. Those fated to lose their homelands engaged in battles bereft of hope and want. That which they lost to the sea of memory, they sought to reclaim from the deep. The wind and waves are correct. We have found it. That giant creature that haunts and gnaws at me, even in my dreams. The time for vengeance has arrived. We set sail. Is this a Lawrence clan dude? Time for vengeance. Tenacity of the Millilith. Flower of Accolades. A flower made from gold leaf. It represents the glories and honors attained by its wearer. In an age when solemn songs were sung from, cliff from the clifftops, a meteorite once fell into the chasm. Oh. Out of the depths of the boundless night sky above, the iron meteorite plummeted to the ground, turning the earth to glazed sand crystal on impact. Though human life is fleeting, Rex Lapis personally ordered the Millilith to rush to the defense of the mines, as the abyss flooded forth. Wait. A meteorite fell into the chasm? Then the abyss flooded forth. Huh. They're meant to be like aliens? The Millilith escorted countless civilians to safety. Miners tell tales of a small number of troops from the rear guard who remained in the chasm. Together with the nameless Yaksha, they fought courageously until they, too, made the ultimate sacrifice among the jagged rocks. Yep, chasm quest. Osatius. In time, the names of both mortals and Adepti alike were forgotten. In time, even the mountains and rivers change form. Yet there will never come a time when their honorable deeds shall be forgotten. Like this gold leaf flower, they will shine on forever, 500 years on. 500 years ago? The harbor city remains as steadfastly peaceful today as the day the disaster is quelled, and still the troops wear this golden flower with pride, in honor of the sacrifice made by their forebears. Ceremonial War Plume A falcon feather worn on ceremonial occasions. It displays the dignity and resolve of Liu Harbor to the outside world. As a mark of military service, the Millilith used the feathers of high-altitude birds of prey to adorn their uniforms. These tail feathers are often worn on ceremonial occasions, 
They boost the morale of the citizenry and fill visiting outlanders with a sense of awe. It is said that in its inception, this ceremonial custom was inspired by the nameless Yaksha. In the heat of battle, when the Yaksha was engaged in fierce combat with the Abyss, some of its plumage was stripped away. The feathers that fell to the ground were then were seen as a symbol of hope. In the end, the brave Yakshan feel the citizenry would sink into an exhausted slumber in the dark lair of the enemy. Rex Lapis was moved by their sacrifice and observed a prolonged vow of silence among the low murmuring of the mountain stone. The people claimed that the nameless Yaksha that defended the chasm was not, in fact, under the command of Rex Lapis. Instead, they believed that it was an act of redemption from a long standing sin. A price paid for cowardice and dereliction of duty. <laughs> well, he went mad. Whatever the truth of the matter, the Yaksha that had once soared through celestial heights had now returned to a free existence amongst the clouds. As for the soldiers, trapped in internal slumber in the depths of the chasm, their legend continues to evolve with the flow of time. Ah, oh, I should have read this when I was doing the chasm. Ding. Anyway, Oracalcius Time Dial. A simple device for telling time. This was once standard issue for the Middleth during times of war. A hardy timepiece powered by sunlight and moonlight. Capable of capturing rays of light even on the darkest of days. When Leah was threatened by a pitch black malice, this time dial helped the soldiers to remember the warmth of the sun. In the course of fighting side by side with the Yaksha, these mortal soldiers could not escape being contaminated by karma or harm during that during the slaughtering. To avoid being consumed by the darkness of a, of constant killing, the Middle-earth soldiers used this timepiece to suddenly mark the passage of time during each battle. They fixed a unified marching pace and scheduled and schedule so that one squadron of mortal soldiers would take the battlefield as the one before them retreated. This cycle of advance and retreat continued all the way to the depths of the chasm, where Yaksha and Valiant soldiers both fell. 100 years later, this timepiece was unearthed by a miner. Its bronze surface sparkled in the bright starlight. Urban legends tell of a collector of curios wearing black robes, who roamed the market streets one day buying up Oracalcius Oracle time dials and paying a generous sum for each one. Some sellers queried him, curious to know what his reasons were but he definitely deflected all their questions with an array of excuses and other verbal tricks. As for what this individual's true motive was, perhaps only the unyielding forward march of time can finally deliver a satisfying explanation. Wearing black robes, that doesn't tell me much. Noble's Pledging Vessel A golden cup used by the Middleth to take their oaths still bears the lovely scent of wine. When the Middle-earth was first founded, Leo was still an average and dangerous, or was still a savage and dangerous place. <laughs> average. Now, the elders of towns, villages, and tribes would pledge oaths of allegiance with the Golden Cup. As a show of loyalty to Rex Lapis and duty to their countrymen, they selected valiant soldiers from all regions. These soldiers became known as the Middleth. They would go on to take up arms with the Yaksha in battle. Fighting from the rear guard, they too drank from that golden cup. There was a final toast to the benevolent and majestic Lord of Geo. With their gaze fixed ahead of them, they stormed into the abyss. Hundreds of years later, a conceited adventurer retrieved the cup from the depths of the chasm and washed away the imperfections. Miraculously, the cup remained whole and untarnished by the time, by the passage of time. 
the pitch dark of that subterranean realm had failed to remove its radiance. Yet more centuries passed, eventually the people of the Ur would tell tales of an era of catastrophe and a nameless Yaksha. Tales of how heroes from disparate heritages and different lands united under a single banner against the abyss. Inevitably, the tale would touch upon the cup, and how the blood of those that went before remained clear and spotless as the day it was spilled. General's Ancient Helm A splendorous helmet from ages past. Clean the dust away and it will look brand new once more. The commander who fought together with the nameless Yaksha fell in the line of duty, as did the handful of his compatriots who fought alongside him. To ensure that the afflicted civilians could safely escape, and to maintain their honor in the eyes of the Lord of Geo, the helmet-clad troops of the front line took the lead, pointing their spears toward the abyss and charging into battle. Disaster arrived in the land of Glaze, and a horde of ancient foes came surging forth. At the order of Rex Lapis, the Yaksha fought a bloody battle against the warped creations of the Abyss. The fight went on until the last drop of blood had soaked into the battlefield, and all that was impure had been cleansed. As the tide of the Abyss receded, the Glaze sands shone gloriously once more. But when the gloom that had filled the skies above the chasm had finally dissipated, the Yaksha disappeared without a trace. As for the general and his men who left their helmets on the battlefield, they rest there in peace forevermore. Okay. That's the pale flame set. How much more do I have? Well, it's uh, a bit more. I'm only doing it up to Fontaine. Stainless Bloom. A hard blue artificial flower. Its petals shall never wither, nor shall its colors fade. You astound me. You have but a human body, and yet you carry such a power within you. You claim that you have no tears left to cry, no blood left to shed. But surely this is because... You have filled yourself with fire. Though your body has long been covered in scars, fierce flames are all that now may flow, like molten iron, from your eyes and your wounds. But we appear to have gotten off topic. I followed the trail of smoke and tracked you down because I wished to strike a deal with you. Let the flames that now devour you be extinguished by the grace of Her Majesty. What to say you? The first Fatus gave power to a young woman, in whom the flame of life had all but died. And in her wild imagination, she saw the line that lay between the corrupt past and the stainless future. I understand. Then let glacial ice take the place of my erased past and extinguish these undying flames. Let the darkness of corruption, the pain of the world, and the humans, beasts, and the sin they carry all be purified by silent ice. But despite this, a pure white flame continued to burn within her heart. We share the same goal, you, your Tsuritsa, uh, you, your Tsuritsa, and I. Cleanse the sources of distortion in this world, short-sighted, ignorant gods, and the darkness and corruption of the abyss. Good. I'll do whatever good. I'll do whatever it takes to become an in effective instrument in the advancement of our common cause. For even if I dress in pure white from head to toe, the ashes of the dead that have long left their stain on every inch of my being can never be cleansed. Obviously, La Signora. Wise Doctor's Pinion. An ominous pinion with edges of unsurpassed keenness 
Perhaps it represents an unnaturally uninhibited nature. A human is nothing more than a machine of a certain level of complexity. Thus declared the youth from his lectern in the seedbed of wisdom. If one were to disseminate, uh, disassemble, disassemble a part of this machine and make enhancements to it, its performance would be greatly amplified. With or without a vision, and irrespective of their physique, physique or combat skills. Enhanced humans would surely display strength far beyond the average. Despite the risk of being denounced as a heretic and permanently cast from the circle of the wise, the youth candidly jotted down these thoughts in the margins of his research notes. As anticipated, no research breakthroughs are possible given the working style of the academia. <laughs> Nevertheless, being expelled would be a loss. One needs an environment conducive to research. Following a trail of rumours of hearsay, of heresy, the first of the Fatui tracked him down. Merely an enhanced human. If your great na nation can flourish or furnish me with sufficient resources and ample time, I could even manufacture that which you could call a god. What to say you? In the desert that shone bright like liquid gold, he inquired of the Snezhnayan diplomat. Do you treat me like, an, like the academia did? Will you call me a monster? A madman? Or will you treat me as my hometown did, and chase me away with pitchforks and clubs? Makes him sound like Frankenstein. However, good. Then we are now in partnership. As for the matter of your title... As for the matter of your title, what do you say to this? Taken completely by surprise by the sheer irony of the title he was given, the young man burst into hysterical laughter. Uh, I don't know who's talking sometimes. But this is Dottore. El Dottore. Moment of cessation. A pocket watch with a cover that cannot be opened. Yet it ticks and talks away following the inexorable flow of time. Money is the lifeblood of the world, and the pathways along which it flows are the world's arteries. Then the center of the world is a heart made of gold. He was not one of the favored, and could only pursue worldly power. But though money ought to mean nothing to the gods, they held it firmly within their grasp nonetheless along with the countless other forms of power that they wielded. Perhaps he lusted for money, because he had once been destitute. Or perhaps the fact that the gods had never looked upon him with favor ignited a burning desire for resistance inside him. The people of the land from which these coins hail reveres contracts above all else. In the name of money, I shall respect the contract between us. We shall, by whatever means necessary, become the heart that pumps money around the world. And when the, mo when the moment comes, that heart shall cease beating by, your will by our will alone. So, this is, uh... The banker. Regrater. That's right. Regret her. <laughs> so he's planning to make Shnezhnaya the, the money capital. And he's planning to destroy all currency. Well, at least Mora. The very concept of Mora. Hmm. For what purpose? I have no idea. Surpassing so cup. An intricately made cup. Its appearance betrays nothing of its age to an observer. He was born with a face fairer than any other, destined to a long life and a hollow will. He was a transcendent being, divinely created, but he was cast aside like a worthless, like worthless dross. Yet due to an error that cannot be known, he roused himself from slumber and began to wander the mortal realm. Before the Fatui found him, he had drifted for countless years, and in that time, this is what his experience had taught him. I am a human who surpasses all others. Even the gods daren't meddle in my feet. 
Neither mortal nor God, nor fate itself is qualified to be my judge. I am free to choose how I wish to spend the remainder of my days. Since these mask-wearing people are so fun to be around, I think I'll be one of them. This is obviously Scaramouche, or the Wanderer. Oh, fuck. And who and began to wander the mortal realm. Yeah, wanderer. Mocking mask. A mask that covers the face, hiding one's expression from others. Since the stain of my compatriot's blood cannot be cleansed, I shall become the jester who laughs in the face of fate. Since my level of learning could not compare with the sages, I failed to earn the favor of the previous ruler. So too did I fail to stop them from tearing away the veil of sin, ushering in a tide of divine wrath, destruction, and foolishness. Then I shall become instead a fool, a fatus, and devote myself to her majesty who understands my pain. My name is Piero, the jester. Please listen to the words I have to say. Proud for two comrades. I know your hearts harbor both the fires of rage and the cold of eternal winter. Each one of us has borne witness to the absurd callousness of the foundational principles of this world. So let us don our masks in mockery of the world as we go forth and rewrite the rules of destiny. It's obviously, uh, well, Jester Piero. And, uh, yeah. Well, he says I uh, failed to earn the favor of the previous ruler, thou hast to be uh, the Cambrian ruler, uh, King Erman. That has to be it. No, right, this is Shimanawa's Reminiscence. Entangling Bloom. A lovely amulet made from twisted cop uh, paper cord. He said to hold the power to make wishes come true. Hmm. An omomori crafted using an art known as Mizuhiki is said to have the power to bind wishes and the reasons for those wishes within itself. Once I learned how to manage the affairs of the shrine under the tutelage of a mighty kitsune. Back then I was just a young shrine maiden who had just arrived on Narukami from a small fishing village. I was duller than a teapot and had yet to lose the obstinate impulsiveness and curiosity of a child. I was always naively skeptical of the elegant but incomprehensible words of Lady Saiki. Everything in the world is entangled, hence illusory visions were born out of concrete reality. The so-called Omamori cannot make one's wishes come true at all, but they can make them eternal through this entanglement. See my befuddled expression, a picture of complete confusion. Lady Kitsune couldn't help bursting into laughter. She cheerfully knocked my head with her pipe and sneakily changed the subject. I suppose you've met your fated one as well, Hibiki? Hibiki. What sort of word is fate? Could there be a rude and reckless brute like that? Oh, is that so? But darkness engulfed everything in the end. That fate, too, was no more. It's Hibiki. From Asase Shrine. No, Shaft of Remembrance. A demon slaying arrow of a rather ancient make. It seems to have been preserved with great care by someone even until the present day. A demon slaying arrow used by the shrine for prayers and to drive away catastrophes it is said to be capable of pursuing and destroying all demons. People often say that demon slaying arrows can drive away evil, but evil is never an objective thing. Evil often stems from within our hearts, born out of delirious minds that have turned cold and ashen from terror. Lady Sagu has been gone for a long time now, and I am no longer that young shrine maiden training at the Grand, Grand Narukami Shrine. Whenever I hold that empty smoking pipe, 
I can feel that emptiness and dull pain hover over me like a phantom. Having someone worth missing. Losing someone whom I cannot help missing. And time keeps moving like a spinning wheel. Silent and tranquil, the Lady Kitsune's white form, hidden in the deep darkness, left a deep impression in the Shrine Maiden's dreams. The great Tengu went into self-imposed exile, enraged at her own incompetence as the Lady Saigu's protector, leaving Teruro, Teruyo behind. Harunosuke left for another country amid the fury of his mourning, while Nagamasa joined the Shogunate to clear the Mikoshi name. As for the man who taught me archery in the sacred forest, and patiently listened to my naive promise under the scarlet sakura bows, he will eventually return to me, even if he were to be blinded by splattering, splattered blood, or turned into a fierce beast by that dark defilement. I shall save him with our bow and arrows, to keep our promise which ever veers towards breaking. I shall destroy evil with our bow and arrows, Exercising folly and needless obsession. Come see me, you idiotic problem gambler. And don't lose your way this time, Konbu Maru. Still, who won the last throw of the dice? She touched the bow lightly while pondering such unimportant things. A lot of names. That I... Sort of remember. Great Tengu went to self-imposed exile. Lady Saigu sacrificed herself, leaving Teruyo behind. Harunosuke, Nagamasa. <laughs> Morning Dew's moment. Uh. A bronze pocket watch adorned with twisted paper cord and a bell. Its hands are forever frozen at the dawn of a certain autumn day. An elegant watch adorned with a shrine bell. The hands always point towards the wee hours of the morning. As the sky brightens, morning dew condenses and then disappears. As beautiful as this colorful scenery may be, it is still short-lived. I once enjoyed the chirping of cicadas and the moonlight with Lady Saigu on a slip in the middle of an autumn night. Back then, I was just a shrine maiden from the country, young and stubborn, like a chirping finch noisily insisting on my own view. A faint smile that crossed the mouth of the Lady Kitsune fascinated me, but her words were, and remain, incomprehensible. Trying to hold on to a moment's beauty is like foolishly trying to grasp the morning dew. Like the morning dew, I have already passed away, and all you have seen of me is but a residual vision, born of your wishes. In that vague memory, she kept saying some incomprehensible things, her expression as sorrowful as the eighth moon's moon. Eight months' moon. And I suddenly... Then she wrapped me over the head with her tobacco pipe, wearing her usual expression of rebuke and mockery. Hibiki, the sun's about to rise. We should head back. Hopeful Heart A special fortune-telling cylindrical object. Their mechanism at the bottom allows one to easily remove all unwanted wish sticks. A special slip cylinder that the shrine uses for fortune telling. It is supposedly infused with good fortune that the kitsune have imparted upon it. Fortune telling is born from the question of lost people. Thus, be it good or bad fortune, it will help them navigate their future. In other words, they are only lost people and no inaccurate fortunes. I've learned a lot while studying at the shrine. Now, even someone as dull-witted as I am has learned how to talk like a uh, mighty kitsune. During this time, even someone as inhuman as the mighty Yoku Tengu have, has gotten a daughter. Even that leatherhead Kombumaru has also become one of the shogun's own Hatamoto and shall soon marry the daughter of a high-ranking samurai. 
such a lovely kid. Even the great Yogo Tengu, Tengu, who used to kill all day for fun, had the mother inside her brought out just a little. Still, the shrine is always missing the liveliness of children. That's not good. Say, Hibiki, how would you like to be a kid again? The lady uh, Kitsune's joke was out of line as always, coming forth with the self-serving scent of sakura wine. Ah, Hibiki, what a long face. How about this then? I, the Lady Sagu, shall tell you your fortune for you. <laughs> See? See? It's great fortune. Great fortune. You know what that means? It means that you look that you took away all the bad fortune slips. Please stop mocking me, Lady Sagu. No, it means that the person you're missing will be lucky enough to become part of your memories forever. That's why you have to be strong and must live on for a long, t long time. Even if all the people you cherish are gone, as long as you are still alive, the time you spent with them will never perish. Mm. So that's why she still appears at the vision. Capricious visage. A well-preserved ceremonial fox mask. A small enigmatic smile ever graces its lips. A bright and elegant festival mask that once brought, belonged to a certain Miko. <clears throat> a faint smile curls the edges of the mask's lips, but there is no real light in its eyes. I spent too much time training at the Grand Shrine, and I must say that I've matured a lot. At the very least, I'm not as foolish as I was when I was young, and I'm more independent now. But for some reason, the more I grew, the more Lady Sagu's face seems to fall under a shadow. What emerges on her face is not anxiety or f nor fear, but rather a sorrowful reluctance. Life is full of uncertainty, love is fleeting, and even lasting memories may be lost. Losing one's memory is no different from losing one's life. It is like death amidst darkness eternal. This time, even a faint smile could not conceal her sorrow. Though this is a festival, festive day, it seems more like a farewell. Right then, why don't you tell me about the idiot Kombumaru? What's wrong? Is he afraid that an old hag like me will steal him from you? I'm not sure I can make it. My throat's beginning to hurt. <laughs> Emblem of Severed Fate. Magnificent Super. Legends hold that this ornate handguard was once fitted upon a sword gifted to the Oni that betrayed the Shogun. Mother had bared her fangs against the Shogun, who had been kind to her and had given her a treasured sword. In the end, the only thing that was sent back to the Mikoshi clan was the Tsuba of the blade which she had loved so dearly. Mother's long cherished wish was to become the destiny of life and death with her boiling passion. She will make such contributions as to make an eternal name for the ever thinning blood of the war oni. If she was engulfed by that pitch black tiger beast of sin itself, then she would tear it apart from the inside. She would have proven her valor resoundly under the Electro Mitsudome Mitsudomoe banner, and she thought she could wash her bloodstained Junit Hitoe battle garb clean. But it was stained black in the end, together with her fiercely beating heart. From then on, her eldest son, who should have inherited the family fortune, lived in seclusion in a village outside the city, with naught but the mountain and wood as his friends. That is, until he met that girl. What a pain. 
Well, if you wish to abandon your past, allow me to give you a new name. Upon hearing about his past, the girl who possessed jet black wings sneered disdainfully. Well, you shall be called Iwakura, the Seed of Rock, a name that human words cannot harm. Come on, mortal in whose veins runs the blood of the Oni. Be glad. Smile a little. You should know that names given by us Yogu Tengu are blessed by with divine powers. Besides, the name Rock suits you. It certainly suits your mind and your muscles, that's for sure. Well then, when the cherry blossoms fall next year, let's have a jewel here, Iwakura. Child of the Oni, hone your swordsmanship and become a foe whom the Yogu Tengu would not be ashamed to cross swords with. Ah yes, if you manage to touch me, you get a get to call your secret blade Tengu Victor. After all, if you get to that point, you have a sword that will let you triumph over the Tengu. So there's the eldest son of uh, the Makoshi clan. Sundered Feather. This was once the black feather of a certain Tengu warrior and was the treasured souvenir of an ancient swordsman. <clears throat> Surrounded by the black feathers seized by his onrushing blade, the man who stood on the cusp of becoming a swordmaster finally caught the girl who had been untouchable for so many years. Yikes, that was a close shave. Well done indeed. If your sword hadn't been broken by your strength, I would have died here for sure. Well then, Terrio, shall we change the venue for our duel next year? There are still a few places I know of where you can also see the Scarlet Sakura falling. As he looked around at the small shrine he had destroyed, holding the Tengu's trembling hand. These words lay on the tip of Michiro's tongue, even as he stared at the black feathers that, had, that he had sliced off. Did touch me after all. I must admit that this is clear your, clearly your victory. Victory has not been decided yet. Let's meet again next year, he wants to say. Now your sword can even surpass the speed of a Tengu. I'll never forget a single one of our duels in these past 13 years. But as a Tengu... I have duties to the clan that I must fulfill. Thinking back, I changed your name in hopes that you might escape from the curse of the Oni bloodline. With that war, non-human blood grows thinner and thinner. Oh well, we should not covet the happy endings that humans enjoy. After all, but you're different. You are now Irakura. You are no longer the Makoshi who shoulders the burden of Oni blood. Goodbye, Michiro. And please forget me. Use your sword for the Irakura bloodline. And open a path that belongs to the Irakura alone. Irakura. Hmm. Storm cage. An exquisite seal cage. Patterned with pansies. Pansies? Painted upon a black backdrop. Decorated with shining inlaid seashells and intricate uh, gold work. In the distant past, when Seiray Island had yet to be shrouded by storm clouds, memories would rise and fall like breaths. In the end, the elegant container that contained thunderstorms and tremors could not be handed over to the one whom it was promised. Did you come to me because the string is broken again? It's such a headache. Other than your swordsmanship, you're just an idiotic old gambler, aren't you? <laughs> Don't you look down on me. I learned my archery from a Tengu, you know. It's pretty famous, too. It's just that I'm too good with a sword, you know. That's why no one ever talks about my archery. Actually, now that I think about it, that's such a waste of good archery. How would I teach it to you, too, then? Uh, teach it to you, then. Once upon a time, you mended that idiot's broken steel cage, all the while speaking those harsh words. Once upon a time, though, you used harsh words to divert others. You could not help but smile faintly. 
Please. You're already a Hatamoto with important responsibilities. Why are you still running around looking for trouble? And you're already married too. To a sweet wife, no less. Why do you want to spend your days wandering and gambling, huh? You're already... The question was on the edge of your lips, but you were unable to ask. And you decided never to bring it up again. If the Lady Sagu had been here with you, she would surely have put it in a clever and merry way. Doesn't matter anymore. I gave myself a holiday, at least for today. Let's leave that whole shrine business behind and sneak off to the seaside, just like we did when you were little. And so he dragged you to the harbour, where you watched the ships sailing back and forth, as if in a trance. You listened to him talk about the terrier of the shrine, and how she had inherited the master's beauty and skill. You listened to him talk about his terrifying nightmares, in which he cut off his own head. But you both knew and those were just words to hide the melancholy of adulthood. Later, a long time later, later, a long time later, overlooking the mossy reefs and the harbour, where the two of you, where the two of you once had a quiet rendezvous, for the gambler to win his bet again, for the sake of praying for his safety, once again you dared to stand upon those heights, holding up the seal cage that you made with your own hands, bearing the hope of retrieving those memories. You gathered the power of thunder and lightning. It's still Hibiki. Scarlet Vessel. An intricately designed wine vessel with a world famous martial artist once drank from. With his secret sword technique, Tengu Sweeper, Irakura Michiro became the Kujo clan swordman, swordsmanship instructor. He also received the title of Doin and founded a successful sword school. Iwakura Art Have I read the Leo artifact ones? I'm pretty sure I have, yeah. As he headed off to take up his post at the Kujo estate, Michiro, who had long learned how to drink, stepped into the branch shrine that had been utterly destroyed by his completion of the Tengu Sweeper. Here in the courtyard of his abandoned branch shrine, he had sparred with the Tengu of Yogo 13 times in the, pa in the last 13 years. He remembered his encounter with the black-winged Tengu, who had called herself Terio of Yogo. Oh, so she's a Terio. Thirteen years went by like a dream. The scarlet snow flies through the shadowed pass like smoke. You have now gone afar. The sacred sakura petals fell then too, as if there were snow from the sky. The branch shrine had lost its lost the god it worshipped, but it was still in a fine state. Laughter as clear as spring water echoed between the mountains. But never again would the two set foot in that desolate yard. Ascension gemstones? I already read the Ascension gemstones. I read all the gemstones already. Ornate Kabuto. A sturdy and hard helmet worn as armor by a noble sword, a samurai. I've been wondering, Sir Doin. Could your sword actually slice through lightning? So said the young Kanjo head, Hiroshi, while sheathing his blade. Doin replied thus, woodenly. How could that be possible? At most I'd say that I could strike a Tengu in midair. That said though, no one has ever brought a Tengu down before, not even once. Is that so? In that case, where does the name of your secret blade, Tengu Sweeper, come from? Life forms? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Seeing that Doin did not answer, the Kanjo head who had built Rito up said, Ah, if it wasn't for your old man Kujo making a move first, I would have loved to recruit you. With your sword, even Ako Domeki of Seirai would be no match. Cleaving through the storm clouds, that Tengu had given him a new name and a new life. She threw him the rusty blade and told him to strike her, a Tengu down. 
and after his sword broke, those were her last words to him. Yeah, he did manage to get a few feathers. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll uh, continue until I finish off Inazuma. Yeah, there's still a lot to read. Was that four? Four more. I don't know how long my throat could hold out. Also, I won't read weapons because, you know, I don't have all the weapons. <laughs> and so I won't bother. Husk of opulent dreams. Bloom times. A small golden ornament with six petals that shall never wilt. It symbolizes the transience of, hu of mortal glories. What he saw in his dream was a phantom dancing to the music under the moonlight. Just like the young man in the distant past, it was akin to a blank sheet of paper, and like a pure yet fragile persona. Emerging once the resentment and suffering had dissipated. The Wanderer did not know that he had any faculties for dreaming, thinking that this must have been the researcher's little trick, or perhaps it was the infinitis... infinite... simile... infinite... infinitesimal... resistance of that bygone heart. You once acquired the heart that you always dreamed of, but it was but a mere prop for lies and deception. Now you will finally obtain what belongs to you, and this false construct of a body can at last aspire to power over this world. Yet this is all but a fleeting dream of glory, and it will all one day drift away amidst the sighs of a suffering earth. Was it a him from the past who said this, or him from the future. The vagrant cared not, for when he awakened, it was not he, but the eternal fu eth ethereal future that dissipated. Is this talking about the Wanderer again? Plume of Luxury A feather-shaped token that was brought forth from a secluded hall. The compassion of its creator led it to being left within that mansion along with a certain slumbering form. The long wandering eccentric no longer thinks about this, but when he closes his eyes, he can still see the moonlight, moonlit nights over Tatarasuna and the burning furnace flames. The kind young deputy said, this gold ornament is a proof of identity granted by the almighty Shogun. But as you travel the world, please bear this in mind. Never to reveal your identity to others. The upright insp inspector said, This gold ornament may be proof of identity granted by the almighty Shogun. But you are neither man nor mechanism. And so you, I can only deal with you in this fashion. Do not hold this against me. Yeah. This wanderer. The wanderer who has left yesterday in the dust no longer thinks about it. But when he covers his ears, he can still hear the wild winds that rolled that year. A pair of expectant, expectant eyes said, This gold ornament is proof of identity granted by the almighty Shogun. It must surely be able to save the people. The intelligent, lovely shrine maiden said, This gold ornament is a proof of identity granted by the almighty Shogun. And she will not abandon you. As for me... I shall do my best to send for help immediately. But in the end, the golden arrow feather were covered in dust, and all tails were incinerated in karmic flames till nothing remained. Also, are you aware of uh, the Bloodstained Knight set? Let me see. Yeah, Bloodstained Shivery. 
It, it gives me like a feeling that uh, this set is from, is based on a, it's basically a white knight. It kills so much and he uh, stains his armor, his armor black. And um, yeah, he he's now become the monster, basically. Okay, and then there's a part that goes here. Ancient kingdoms wrongfully accused, turning its inhabitants into monsters. A crater of chivalry tolerates no not such injustice. If abyss be thy name, I pledge to you my loyalty. Apparently. So apparently a bloodstained knight joined the abyss. But this this type of lore reminds me of uh, Alakino. And how her hands are stained black. So maybe maybe she's uh, sort of like a bloodstained knight. That's what I'm thinking, anyway. <laughs> but that passage about the abyss won't make sense unless uh, she secretly joined the abyss. <laughs> Song of Life. As far as Inazuma is concerned, this is some small object from overseas. The heart of this mechanism has been removed, and its hands no longer turn. He was originally born to be a vessel for a heart. Gnosis. But he shed tears in his dreams. His creator observed thus. He was too fragile, whether it be a, as a human or as a tool. Yet his creator would not destroy him, and so allowed him to continue slumbering. In her later, later works, she would also consign designs that might store such a heart to obsolescence. Not long after, that noblest and most prestigious proof in the world would come to have no home, and thus was sent to the great shrine at Mount Yorgo. Later, the beautiful puppet awoke and began his wanderings. He observed many a heart, good ones, upright ones, strong ones, gentle ones. The puppet, too, desired a heart. Later, the lovely puppet would finally obtain that heart. It was, after all, his purpose for being. The very reason he existed. Yet, it was not what the puppet truly desired, for it did not contain any blessings, but was instead a sacrifice brimming with selfishness, hypocrisy, cunning and curses, all wrapped in an amiable husk. Good and evil were the song of sentient life, useless and cacophonous, but if he were to wrench this heart out, he would no longer be able to feel anything at all. And so he did. Calabash of Awakening. A gourd that has been adorned with a powdered gold, with powdered gold and black paint. Its original color can no longer be discerned, but its main use seems to be as a performance prop. Can use it as a bottle, I guess. Amenoma, Futsu, Ishin, Hyakume. Senju. These were once upon a time the five branches of the Raiden Gokakaden. Gokaden. But today, only Amenoma still maintains its line of succession, while the Ishin line can just barely be said to have extant descendants. In the eyes of the people, this is just a natural result of the ravages of time. They never once suspected that such sudden falls from Greece might have some hidden mystery behind them. The Wanderer would never admit to this. He would never admit that he had once uh, that he had done this as an act of revenge against the Bladesmith. Nor would he ever mention the truth that he had abandoned his schemes halfway because they had suddenly become dull. He would only say, in that tone of voice. He had learned from a certain researcher. It was all just a little experiment into human nature. In Inazuma's traditional theater, there's a certain character known as Kunikuzushi. Such characters are often schemers and usurpers of nations. At the end of his wanderings, he chose his, this name as an act of his own will. And as for the name he had once used, even he no longer remembered it. It is a norm in Inazuma's traditional theater to join the names of 
a place three acts together to form the player's name. For example, Sumire, Sumire Zome, Sangetsu, and Kogetsu Kan come together, thus forming the play Sumire Zome, Sangetsu, Kogetsu Kan. Perhaps a day will come when this body's adventures, its experiences, will become tales to be passed along by mortals, distant memories that flow through the ley lines. But for now, this his third act is still ongoing. Skeletal Hat The hat that once shielded a wanderer from the sun and rain. It eventually became a convenient tool with which faces might be hidden and expressions obscured. Where are you going, wanderer? The roving youth was stopped by a child's shout. That was a child of a Tatsu Tatarasuna craftsperson, and while he was ill, his eyes were still clear. The youth told the child that he was bound for Inazuma City. But it's raining really hard right now. They said that the people who left haven't returned. The youth opened and closed his mouth a few times, but at last he could only give the child a small smile. The next time he set foot upon the island, that child was nowhere to be found. Where are you going, Inazuma? This boat is not for you. The wandering young man was halted by the harbour by a boatman, but before the youth could draw his blade, a man in his company stopped him. The man told the mariner that the outlander youth was with him. Ah, so he's your guest, sir. My apologies for, your presu for my presumption. The man gave the youth a coat to keep the cold out, but the youth shook his head. He had no need for such of such things. He only wished to know what interesting things he might find on this long journey. Lord Harbinger, where are you headed? The youth, hating chatty humans the most, gave his subordinate a backhand slap. <laughs> Just backhanded him. But he also loved watching expressions of terror and helplessness play across human faces. And it was perhaps precisely because of this imbecilic underling's expressiveness that he had kept, him, kept them around. He told the groveling, quailing figure that they were headed east for Mondstadt. I understand. I'll get your bodyguards ready right away. Uh, right now. They had no need for guards, of course. But he was lazier still to barter words with cretins. Donning his wanderer's hat, he headed eastward alone. Child, where are you going? Returning home, the youth was stopped at the roadside by an old woman. He told her that he was going west, to Yashiori Island. To, Yash to Yashiori Island, then? What business are you on? She had said this thoughtlessly. Knowing only the things that had not, knowing only that things had not been peaceful of late, the youth thanked her for her concern with earnest smile, and told her that he was bound for an appointed meeting. As the boat gradually approached the shore, a lady in a foreign garb could be seen standing by the shoreline, and she threw a small crystal sphere, the youth from afar. Catching it with ease, he lifted it up to the dying, blooded sun. Yeah. The first time he was bound for Inazuma City. That was probably when he had the golden feather to seek uh, uh, an audience with uh, the Raiden, Shogun. Where are you going, Inazuma? This boat's not for you. Uh, for this one, I'm not sure. Well, it's in the Zuma Harbor. I don't know. Lord Harbinger, where you head east? So this is like the 1.1. The meteorite. And the last one, he's meeting with Signora. In a... Yashioria. Yeah, first appearance law. I mean, he's, he's heading to Mondstadt. Alright, we'll read these three and then uh, I'll end the stream with this. My, my throat can't take it. <laughs> Otherwise, I still gotta hunt for more, uh, more relics. Ocean Hood Clam. 
Um, seed eyed blossom. A soft flower that has taken on the many shades of the capricious ocean. It shines with wondrous colors under the moon's silver light. A tender flower from the ocean. Its core is adorned with pure pearls. The songs of Watatsumi Island say that these flowers bloom in the pearl lit depths. Steeped in the love sickness of the diving sea daughters and the gentle moonlight, they will give off a pearly gleam. When all conflicts have ceased, the sea beasts shall no longer weep for their lonesome companions. When the moonlight rises over Torzan, Torzan, the lovely deity shall rise and sing. Come, sea daughters, come and see, O oh, people of my heart, for the moon is out tonight. Though Torzan might fall this night, the lightning and the storm may never hide the moon's pearly glory. The lonesome maiden, maiden will sing and dance upon the moon's silver waves. The divers shall forget the pain of loss, and even the tender flowers will regain their vibrance. I have no idea who the hell this is. <laughs> Alright, this is... Deep Pallas's Plume. A down feather with the same hue as coral, said to have come from a shrine made in ceremonial garment. In the days when the many clans first saw the light of day, Omikami uh, chose shrine maidens from among the people of the sea. In the island songs of history, the first divine priestess was once such. Uh, was once one of the sea daughters who collected pearls. She would come amongst the children, who in their meaningless conflict, conflict, lost sight of their future, and amongst the old who had lost sight of their of life's beauty amidst ruthless tragedy. The divine priestess comforted the people using her lovely songs and gentle words, and even amidst the stormy times, the people of Watatsumi saw hope for the first time. This seaborne feather was said to have come from the divine priestess's ceremonial garb. It was plucked by mistake by a child's tender hand, and was preserved by a fretful person. Later, when the brave hero and priestesses rushed to their irrevocable sacrifice, the divine priestess's ceremonial garment was not lost, but passed down in memory to the present day. Yeah, this would be a uh, Inkonomiya slash Watatsumi slash uh, Kokomi. Carry of Parting. A clean, flawless shell that comes from the bottomless ocean. Wait, is it? <laughs> it has little clock hands on it. <laughs> Time seems to be past seems to pass exceedingly slow in the silent, fluorescent ocean depths. Even the bright seashells might grow forgetful as the years lengthen. The people of Watatsumi once came forth from the darkness, and thus bade farewell to the long dreams of the deep. They escaped the prying gaze of the dragonairs in the dark, walking the glimmering coral stair in the realm of daylight. It is said that at that time, the ocean people would take a single seashell as remembrance for their clan, and as for those who had lost their uh, uh, those who had lost theirs, they would be welcomed into a new family. In the ancient tongue, these pure shells would become known as the parcels of reunion. Two parties who embrace shall not again be parted by an outside force, though this enjoining is not itself eternal. These seashells, therefore, were a farewell to life beneath the waves, and the beginning of a new life under the sun. Pearl Cage The shining pearls that the shrine maidens of Watatsumi Island offer up shine eternally and never dim. To the sea people, the bright pearls that Watatsumi's deity once praised are priceless treasures. Only the Divine Priestess has the right to sing the great song themed around those pearls. Legend has it that the rainbow-hued clams produce these flawless gems in gratitude for Watatsumi's tenderness. 
In later days, it was even said that the bloodline of the Divine Priestess was originally birthed from these pearls. Having stepped from her soft, vivid cradle, she and the sisters who danced with the sea and moon were greatly favored. For out of this rejoice for out of his rejoicing and love, Omikami gave unto them beautiful gems that granted them the pure desire to pursue daylight. In the hands of those whose veins run true with Watatsumi blood, pearls seem to gleam brighter than normal. Perhaps this is but an ancient tale, the truth of which can no longer be verified. But it is said that at the point of defeat, the Divine Priestess and the Twin Sisters exchanged their clothes and concealed themselves within the endless waves. Only this bright pearl was lost in the rippling tumult, the returning to the silent solitude of the depths. Now, I don't really get this uh, set. Tumult? What, are they fun? Point of defeat. You mean when Omakami was killed? Oh no. What's this? Crown of Watatsumi? An ancient, intricate crown that was once used by a forgotten clergy member. Today, this relic has been enshrined with great ceremony by the people of Watatsumi. Omikami once selected his clergy from amongst the people of Watatsumi, personally giving them these circlets of office. But when the age of the martyrdom passed, and the old priesthood passed with it, these lovely crowns were sealed. The people of the sea seeing the, that these crowns of pearls and corals will never be stained by any dirt, and that any who should have the fortune to receive one will be recognized as the rulers by Omakami. The valiant vassal lord known as Tozano and the twins who traversed the waves freely, they all had Omikami's tender gaze and favor, and have been immortalized in the islanders' songs. It is said that these rulers once served as the deity's auxiliaries, guiding the people of the sea to farm, fish, and hunt on their island. But as the time of destined martyrdom came, a god would fall, bearing the hopes and memories that were brought up from the ocean depths and stepped in a history and culture that are now lost. These intricate and enchanting crowns passed with their owners onto the Forgotten Rifts. Into the Forgotten Rifts. Yeah, everything kind of went to shit when Omakami died. They, they just gave up all their uh, culture and tradition. Vermilion Hereafter. An ancient memento, uh, a flowering life. It still looks as alive as the t as the being that preserved it several centuries ago. Ooh, which being? Even the ancient cinnabar cliffs were once home to lovely blooming flowers. Even in the era when black and blood flowed freely, they were not stained by even the smallest smud, a smidge of dirt. Not mud. While the Millilith stands guard, evil shall never prevail. Oh, Millilith again. Even shall the enemy be dark demons, this, will, this would not change. Of course, this would count as part of a year, right? The silent mountain people and the steel moon constructed their peaceful camp. O oh, daughter of the cliffs of glazed sand crystal, weep not for me. I was born in the shade of Tian Heng, and I fight to repay Rex Lapis's mercy. I entrust my life to the four armed Yaksha, and we shall go into the glowing depths. The shadowed road of the darkest pits we shall tread. We shall brave the stony crystal halls. We shall face the defilement. Arising from the depths, that twisted beast that dwell there, these horrors and their strangeness shall not put me to flight or fear. The night wind interrupted the miller's soldier's words, causing him to be unable to finish what he had to say. He simply left the, this small flower for that young daughter of the mountain tribe as a memento, a ward against forgetting. The only thing I truly fear is to be lost and forgotten. 
should ill fate dictate that I am unable, that I am to be buried in some nameless place, do not forget me. Feather of Nascent Light A dimly lustrous pinion steeped in strong emotions. Legend has it that a hero once plucked an eagle's feather from atop the highest cliff of the chasm. It is also said that those who could accomplish such a deed earned the right to die alongside the Adepti, going to one's death willingly in defense of the people. A good cause indeed. Yet if you think about it, this would be akin to fishing, fish sinking into a deep pool or a bird plummeting into a forge. I may yet achieve my own desire, but we shall go unknown and ultimately unremembered. Mortals like us are like feathers, caught up in a whirlwind, floating up, or floating into the deep sky. Saving, defending, in the end, these are all pointless things, void of meaning. These dark murmurings shook the hearts of those who would never make a name for themselves. But the battle was over in the end, and many a soldier would rest eternally in the cavernous depths. The freakish cries of the dark forces were also silenced like fading ripples. And though mortal spans are short, the, uh, the land will forever remember. Yeah. They're willing to die, but they're, they're not willing to be unremembered or forgotten. Solar Relic. An ancient timepiece with a mighty solid look. Its luster is produced by a sand crystal. It is said that Rex Lapis was still young. The sun was a chariot that raced across the earth. When the three sisters of the night sky were martyred in a calamity, the solar chariot fell into a deep gorge. The mountain people, taking it for a sign, repaired the device allowing it to shine through the darkness again. And though it was returned to its constant westward cycle, a single piece would forever remain behind. When they moved to the city, they would grind that fragment into crystals and sell it to someone who knew its value. Hey, hey, that's a joke, right? I mean, you can't just trust these beastless folktales, can you? The merchants of Sheng Lu Hall have long left their obscurity and forgotten their past. Glittering sand crystal cannot easily be made into lacquerware. After all, nor is it suited to be to making luxurious luxury paints. According to the miners at the chasm, and mind you don't believe this story too readily either. This timepiece and sand crystal came from the middle of 500 years ago. In the lightless abyss, where light wrestled against darkness, even one with a yaksha might... Yaksha's might could not hold out for long. And all the more did mere mortals need light to prevent them from uh, getting lost in the steel curtain of devouring night. The Millilith thus collected glowing sand to light the way. And it just so happened to resemble the pale moonlight. The timepiece for its part told the time they spent there in the abyss and serves as proof that they, that where they fell, others have come after to take up their duty. Moment of the Pact An old cup made of sand crystal, its luster is somehow undimmed by age. This place, known as the Chasm, has shone with a cinnabar luster since ancient days. The mountain miners and the metropolitan merchants still tell the legend of a Yaksha. It, it's not probably it, it is it's it's bodacious i mean bodacious <laughs> people say that the lone traveler with four arms once came to the barren wastes where the stars fell hearing that this wandering figure's evil exercising travels and now brought them hence the tribes people of the mountains came forward one after another guests from afar please accept our wine and hear our plea you may consider our aged spirits bitter and hard to swallow. A far cry from the sweet bruise of Mount Tianheng and even Rex Lapis praises. But the heavens have graced us with stores of precious stones and marvelous jade, and we carve the jagged rock for a living. Thanks for the grace of thanks to the grace of Rex Lapis, our lives are, while not ideal, at least free of terror. 
yet things have changed, and a dark shadow is cast over the blessing we have received from the fallen star. Yeah, Meteor fell here. We do not have any precious gifts to present as a pledge, but still we beg for your, for your sucker. The guests heard the elders plea, and silently drank every drop of that bitter wine. The guests promised nothing, and did not chastise the mortals for their insolence, but simply turned east, disregarding all attempts to make them stay. As for what came after, all now know what happened. But the simple crystal sand wine cup that the guests shared with the tribal elders remains to this day a testament to their pact. So he ended up helping them. I wish we were all rare. Aware. Thundering poise. Ah. Now I think about it, why this is all purple is because this is what? Bosatius. This is even Bosatius's mask. Okay. This mask is said to have been made by the mountain people for Yaksha. It is of a simple make, but its surface still shines brightly nonetheless. Tian Chu once played host to a Yaksha, four-armed and mighty. He came to the chasm from afar to the praises of the tribes, a feast they put forth for him, the food in abundance. Blade in hand, he entered the chasm, a disaster to still. Mighty as a demon, purple bale fire shone in his eyes. The lightning pierced a deathly shadow, and thunder dissolved the darkness. The clouds hid the abyss, more stretching to devour the firmament. The wild winds howled, the cinnabar sweeping the, the darkness. The mountain ranges shock, and the gorges caved in. The depths cry out, cried out as they collapsed, and then all was silent. The dense clouds solidified, sundown light as the per perching birds sang s sadly. Do you not hear? The drums die in the north wind, and the hero sinks into the vortex. Have you not seen? The youngsters battle for the dawn, alas, for a life so spent. Well, this will be the last one. Soul Scent Bloom, Echoes of an Offering. A jade carved into the shape of a flower, a phantom scent, here one instant and gone the next, swirls around it. Each year when the spirit-scent spirit flowers bloom, Chaoying Village will prepare for its tea-serving ceremonies. Once the flowers wither, flower tea infused with nine layers of scents are presented in the village hall. The spirit-scent flower is a fleeting thing, much like the sudden coming, of go coming and going of a certain adeptus. This one left behind the ambiguous name of Herblord, as well as many foggy and fragmented legends. Herblord? In one such tale, the Herb Lord's adeptal fawn would turn into the branches of an ancient tea tree. In another, the adeptus flew up to the adeptal mountain on a subdued evil beast. There's even a story that goes like this. The young lady grasped at the hood, hooded hat on the ground as she struggled ashore, placing it on her head haphazardly. For if she did not cover her face, then she might feel embarrassed and find herself at a loss for words. Just then, the orchestrator of her suffering poked their head out of the water. The rainbow scales of their body glimmered, as if to revel in its victory. <coughs> Alright. So you can swim. Very impressive. You know what? May you drown someday. She spoke these words in anger, but also in jest. And yet that glittering streak would eventually sink into the depths never to come back to the surface. Jade Leaf A jade ornament shaped like a leaf. It seems to have once had a deep meaning between specific friends. A very long time ago, there was no ford across the river, only a misty hillside. The owner of this mountain had yet to decide what to plant here when someone preempted them. Once this tree gets a bit larger, I'll cut its leaf leaves down and make some tea for you all, for all of you. When that time comes, we'll get Cloud Retainer and Mountain Shaper to come over. Seriously, you plant trees all the way, uh, any way you like on my turf and you have the nerve to spout such things? Even though the young lady will, who was master of this mountain complained, she too 
could imagine the tea's fragrance. Later, someone would quietly tie this jade pendant to the thin branches of a of the small tree. When more time had passed, the mountain's master returned, but in a changed aspect, and sands the finger that might untie the pendant. This was a long time ago now. Many years later, the branches of this tree would be grafted to the other side of the river by the mortals who dwell in the mountains. The fragrance of tea would also travel from this place, Chen Yu Vale to Liyue Harbor, and from there to many more places still. Now many legends concerning the tea trees of Chen Yu Vale. One of them goes like this. No matter the water, soil or sunlight, this sort of tree only grows lushly in Chen Yu Vale. It's because it remembers the promise that old friends made in the ancient past beside the tea sapling. <coughs> harder to read. Symbol of Felicitation A circular jade ornament. Legend has it that it was once used somewhere as a symbol for rituals to begin. It is said that this jade ornament comes from the long sealed sacred mountain, just as star conch separated from the sea will recall the sound of the waves. The ornament will also emit the sound of flowing water. You might often hear such rumours in inns. You know, legend has it that the greatest treasure of the mountains is a slab of fine jade that can bring down sweet rains. But when the world was in turmoil, demons began to covet its power. So the master of the mountain split into many parts, forming each part into different shapes, so as to hide them. Then the master concealed them underwater, in the hills, and some were even offered to shrines. In the legend of the Chen Yu Vale, these jade ornaments bear the blessing of a deity's pact. It's just that no one has been able to find them, even after so many years. The priest had been ever careful in hiding this jade loop on their person, but on certain years they would discreetly show it to a friend, no sense of refinement to the uh, on the eve of a departure. The priest would speak of its patterns and its origins, and of the pact made with the deity of their ancestors. Uh, by their ancestors. But the friend was busy pounding herbs with mortar and pestle, and did not hear a single word. We do this song and dance every year, and I've heard this story who knows how many times. Didn't you say you'd treat me to some tea when you get back? Let's talk then. But that which came from the waters was not that which she had thought would come, and would vanish henceforth back into those waters. Till today, the artisans of Yilong Port, <coughs> on Yilong Port, will make such simple ornaments. Visiting merchants will often, will also often place these jade loops close to their ears, as the legend says, wondering if they can truly hear the sound of the rain pitter-pattering on, mount on mountain stone. Chalice of the Font This teacup forever overflows with fresh water. Perhaps it was a gift from an adeptus, or their relics or just something they left behind. This was originally a gift from a friend, linked to a small realm within. A realm within. The spring within the chalice would never dry up, making it a fine place to temporarily stay. It could hold a reflection of the sun and moon and could play host as swimming fish. Swimming fish. Compared to the ill fated uh, ill fate according to according to the Yaksha, she believed that she was luckier by far. But the price for inheriting the ancient rice was to never spend much time on land. In those days the sweet waters did not flow across Liu in such abundance. The harbour city beneath the mountains and the gathering in the plains was to her a distant dream. But that person, ever afraid of trouble, decided to set off with this teacup in hand. This Liu harbour she spoke of would almost certainly be full of flaws as a village ceremony. This journey would surely be full of arguments, struggle, and many troubles. She knew that they both quite enamoured with their gifts of the gab, but much less with crowds. 
No one else in this world could you find two adepti as small as they, envious and fearing prosperity in equal measure. But we had promised each other many things in the past, and this is very good. As they were to leave, she thought thus. Well, at least this trip will be interesting. I can introduce her to some other old friends. Later, the braziering tea kettle will come into common use, and thus the tea cape, teacup shape too was taken up by people. And thus did everyone become able to have the moon in their desk and hold it in their palms. Who is this about? Flowing rings. A pair of earrings made from a single piece of jade. It has a most gentle texture. Chenyu Vale is home to many mountains, <coughs> streams and stories. According to these, uh, among these, the most famous is, a long time ago, there was a priceless gem that fell into the hands of a demon and was thrown into the waters where it sunk. The wide river of a legend will oft produce many tributaries. One of these goes like this. This gem was once a, once jade from a sacred mountain, carved into its current shape only by the hand of Rex Lapis himself. And the stone that had been lost to the waters may have been a lesser jade, or perhaps a, just a simple cup. Some even say that the jade in the tale is in fact an analogy for a beautiful person. The legends even have it that people had once seen this unnumbered koi with tails like gems in the sunlight, having left the shackles of the lakes and rivers to which aquatic creatures are bound, flying freely with the wind in the sky. So too did the pair of jade earrings belong to a certain person change form. Where? Who's this about? It's about that girl. I know who it is, but whatever. Yep, uh, that's gonna do it for me. I, my throat can't take it, so I have to. I have to end it. The sharing by Fremen Today, Linny and Lynette used magic to create a small cake for me. The cake has a lot of different fresh fruits arranged on top with dollops of cream frosting crowded in between that reminded me of water droplets. It looked really delicious. I want to cut a piece for you, but I just couldn't find the right angle to cut it. Though I tried for a long time, the cake really is just too perfect. After discussing with Linny and Lynette, I decided to place the whole thing in the box and bring it over to share with you. I took care to walk slowly so it wouldn't have gotten bumped or jostled on the way. Cake is a luxury, but friends are even more precious. After we finish eating it, would you like to take a night walk with me beside the sea? How about a night swim? But yeah. We barely know Fremen, eh? I'm not sure why he's sending us <laughs> a cake. Anyway. Let's take a survey. Immersion Satisfaction Survey. Start. Oh, year am I born? 91. Male. I would hope. <laughs> How do you feel about this version of the game? This 4.0? It's very good. Very satisfied. How satisfied with the storyline contact? Of this version? We're very satisfied. Now satisfy you with the following our conquests. <coughs> it's very, very, uh, what do you call it? Surprising. So I'll say somewhat satisfied and this one, oh my God, this one just blew it out of the water. Very satisfied. So much emotion in this one. 
Everyone has satisfied with the Mega Mecha Melee event. Oh yeah, I did it. It's just It's just a rhythm game. Somewhat satisfied. Everyone has satisfied with the new regions. They're very good. Although I didn't explore them uh, to that much of an extent. I would say it's somewhat satisfying. New underwater and, la and land areas. New underwater areas. Well, I'm satisfied with the underwater areas. Land areas, it's, it's okay too. Yeah. They had the new um, particle effects. And I really like that. It makes it feel more alive. You know, like uh, a pollen flying around. Petals of flowers, leaves. Everyone, how satisfy you with the following characters? Lenny? Satisfied with him? Yeah, sure. Lynette? Satisfied, it's satisfied. Feminine is very f fun to use. You know what? I'll just keep him somewhat satisfied here. Yeah. <laughs> Yelan? Uh, uh, very satisfied. Jean Lee? Uh, sure, yeah. I'm satisfied with the following events. Verdict of Blades. It's alright. This one. Uh, uh, well, it has you um, go around taking pictures of different shit, but uh, I, I, I would like it if it took different pictures of them um, doing different animations. So. Yeah. That's why I rate it a little bit lower. Creations from the Hydro Nation. What is this again? Relic Records. That book thing at the very beginning, isn't it? Well, that kind of forced my exploration, so I'm not too sure about it. <laughs> I wanted to get to the water naturally, but uh, that, that thing forced me here. Let's go into it straight away. How satisfy you with the weapons in this version of the game? And you can learn the first great magic. Oh, the, the, the new weapons. I didn't pay attention. <sighs> Sorry to say, I did not pay attention. Satisfied with you, you function multi layered map. I am. somewhat satisfied I won't say very satisfied because there's still a, a bit that has to show how satisfied with the Numa Uisha and Mutual Annihilation well it's an extra mechanic so it's alright it doesn't get in the way it does not uh, you know, it's not exactly a hard requirement. How satisfied are you with the wish system? Well, oh, um... Can't say I'm unsatisfied with it, but, you know, it's fine. It's what it is. How satisfied are you with the in-game benefits? game benefits. Barely any. How satisfied with the character and weapon enhancement materials, including weapon character. I mean, how satisfied am I with them? Am I getting enough of them or something? <laughs> Let's say neutral. How interesting do you find the in-game content in Genshin Impact? Everything? <laughs> are, you, are you asking everything? 
It's somewhat interesting. The first do you find the in-game content against your impact? Well, you have the TCG. You have Spiral Abyss. You have Exploration. It's very diverse. You have Story. How novel do you find the in-game content against your impact? It's somewhat novel. That's satisfied with the time and effort needed while playing Genshin Impact. It's actually, it's actually very good. <laughs> like, um, I'm playing Star Rail, and that I'm dreading it because it's taking more time than I actually have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm somewhat satisfied. How do you find the quant? of content it's just right how satisfied are you with the gaming security bring account security plugins well I'm not being hacked so uh, I guess it's very satisfied the main long-term goals in Genshin Impact currently uh, let's see The quests, yep. Advanced main plotline, yep. Quests are the main point. Obtain characters and weapons, that's not really that high. Unlock map and explore, yeah. How willing are you to continue experiencing Genshin Impact? Definitely willing. How willing are you to recommend Genshin Impact to your friends? Uh, definitely willing. Except for Will. <laughs> How satisfied are you with Ho versus a company? Well, I don't know much about it. Like, they make collabs and stuff, but... Hmm. I'll keep it simple. I don't think I need any, uh... Extra comments. Alright. Okay. Did I click on the right one? No. Money! Defeated local legend, fading veteran. Well, that be all. So, um, uh, catch you guys later. <laughs> Yeah, my throat can't handle it. I can't continue. All right. Seems like uh, two hours is my upper limit. I I'd, I'd rather like one hour for these. It's a it's a lot. I feel like I'm losing my voice. So uh, I will not be continuing. It's a peach. <laughs>